Good evening. This is Peter Helen with <clears throat> From Such Withdraw, who was formerly Faith of Our Southern Fathers. Uh, tonight, uh, E. Michael Jones, Dr. E. Michael Jones, will be on. Now, he's a little bit late. He rides his bike here, so uh, it's um, a little bit snowy. Uh, but we're going to be talking on um, his class, his lecture series that he was going to be um, offering here in town, but was canceled, so now he's going to have to do it on the TV. And um, for the next 10 weeks, <clears throat> I think, on Faith of Our Fathers, on Monday night at 10 o'clock, uh, he's going to present <clears throat> his um, lecture series, which is based on uh, his book, uh, The Revolutionary Jew. In fact, I hear that he's, he's coming in here uh, shortly. Uh, the theme of his book um, originates in the scriptures, and um, it seems like, if I could interpret uh, what's going on here, is that the church has always taught that, uh, that the Jews were responsible for uh, crucifying Christ. Uh, Pilate, um, uh, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, this is Matthew uh, 27, 24, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Um, Mike, we're already on the air. How was your bike ride? Um, I'm introducing the... Here's my theme that I'm saying that I, th I think that... Uh, that you're going to be wanting to present on this uh, uh, lecture series. Right. Uh, what I'm saying here is that the tradition of the church has been basically that the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. Uh, Pilate said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. But there's been a reversal, and the emphasis has been, well, it was the Romans that were responsible. Right. And so they're, they're like the Jews really weren't that responsible. And the old teaching of the church until just recently placed the, the, that the Jews were guilty of the crucifixion of Christ. And the, the church's position was that, that that attitude has always been in the Jews, and the, and the Christian was to be a little bit leery, or very leery. Right. Did you, do you have, uh, can you turn to uh, Thessalonians 2? Sure. Yeah, the, um, the the church, if you're talking about the Catholic Church, the church's teaching has not changed in this matter in terms of official documents. Yeah, my position is that, uh, that the Catholic Church draws a lot of their teaching on the church fathers. Right, right. and the scriptures. But uh, the, the Nostra Aetate says, the, the exact quote from Nostra Aetate is that not all Jews at the time of Christ were responsible for his death. Well, logically, that means that some Jews at the time of his death were, respo or the t uh, were responsible for his death. Right. Uh, St. Paul says this, um, I believe, in... Uh, first Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians first. I think it was uh, second, First Thessalonians. It says, um, uh, the Jews who both killed 14, the... Fourteen, yeah. Yeah. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And so, yeah, well, this, this is, uh, uh, I guess this is a lead into our, our discussion. Because uh, the question is, uh, uh, do, do we have the right to talk about this? I mean, do we as Christians have the right to open this Bible and discuss these things with each other? Or well, has that right been abrogated and we have not been told about it? 
Well, okay. Yeah. Well, do, obviously, do we have do we have the right? Obviously, uh, the American position is the current American position is that the gays have a right to be downtown marching. The Ku Klux Klan has a right to be marching, and we also have a right to speak what we think is our view. Okay. Well, if that's the case, and we have a right to read scriptures, you will notice that the issue of the Jews in Scripture is a big issue. As a matter of fact, if you read the New Testament, it is an inescapable issue. The conflict between Christians and Jews right. is inescapable. Well, it's, it's, it's almost it's near or at the heart of the gospel. The gospel is uh, Christ came and was crucified uh, for our sins. And But, but if you read uh, uh, Stephen when he was martyred, if you read Peter in Acts... He, they kept saying, you crucified him. And, he's, and they're addressing their fellow Jews. He kept saying, right. you crucified him, but God had ordained that that to happen. And he rose on the third day. So the emphasis was the Jews who were, who were, who were Christ's people. I mean, he came unto his own, and his own rejected him. Yeah, well, I mean, the, in a, the Christ came, and the Jews had to make a decision. And some of the Jews accepted him, and some of the Jews rejected him. And the conflict in history has been between these groups ever since. Uh, that is the thesis of a book I just wrote. And uh, it also leads me to the topic uh, that I'd like to talk about today, namely uh, the, the Forever Learning Institute. Uh, about uh, in the fall at some point, I was called up by a lady by the name of Jane, Joan Loringer, who was the executive director of the Forever Learning Institute, and uh, she asked me if I would be willing to t uh, teach a class on publishing. So I said, okay, went and gave the course, talked about publishing. I've been in publishing the magazine for 25 years now. I figured I knew something. So anyway, I suppose the course, the class went well because afterwards when I walked out, she came up to me and she said, gee, I like that. How would you like to teach a course here? So I said, uh, okay. And she said, you can teach on anything you want, anything you want. So I said, well, I just finished this book, and so the stuff is fresh in my mind, so I'd like to teach a course on the revolutionary Jew and his impact on world history. And she said, great. That sounds like a great topic. I'm sure everyone will be interested in this topic. Okay, so that's where we left it. Then she got back to me. She asked me to submit a, a summary of the course, which I did. Everything was fine. And then on January 18th of this year, which is to say a little over a week ago, I got this letter from Joan. Uh, Dear E. Michael Jones, thank you for your generous offer to teach this semester. Our spring semester has over 20 new classes and several new teachers. We are anxious to get underway and have completed the spring course and registration guide this past week. Your course, The Revolutionary Jew, is scheduled to take place on Monday at 9, uh, from 9 to 9.55. And then there's an orientation meeting, which she hopes I will come to, and then she says, thanks again. It is certain that without your efforts, there would be no Forever Learning Institute. I am looking forward to blah, blah, blah. Yours truly, Joan Lauringer, Executive Director. Okay, so that sounds to me as if everything's okay. Then, one week later, January 25th, I get another letter. Dear Dr. Jones, on behalf of the Forever Learning Institute Board of Directors, I regret to inform you that we must cancel your proposed course for this semester. It is our practice to re review the appropriateness of a course on those rare occasions when concern is expressed to us about its content. This is one of those occasions, and unfortunately we do not feel there is adequate time to perform an appropriate review before classes start on February 12th. Sincerely, Christopher Bowman, President, Forever Learning Institute Board of Directors. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Bowman. You did review the course. I submitted a description of the course to your executive director, and it was approved. So there's a mystery here, isn't there? There's a mystery. We go, we make 180 degree. Here's one letter, one letter on the 18th, one letter on the 25th. This one says yes, this one says no. What happened here? Well, what happened? What happened is that in the in between those two letters, the course selection, the course roster of the Forever Learning Institute was published on the last page of the South Bend Tribune, in the smallest 
type face known to man. It looked like three-point type or something like that. I got out my magnifying glass when I saw it. And there, right under the course on knitting, is my course, The Revolutionary Jew, and what happened. Now, what happened after that? Okay, within minutes, within minutes... Of that newspaper of landing that newspaper on people's doorsteps. Arriving at the, the homes of South Bend residents, every rabbi in town, plus the Jewish Federation, called up the Forever Learning Institute and demanded that my course be canceled. Now, how do I know this? Because Joan Lauren Jay called me up that day and told me that's what happened. She told me that was what happened. Every, this is what she said, every rabbi in town plus the Jewish Federation has demanded that your course be canceled. Now, why was, I mean, what, what do you know about the course? Did you, I mean, how did you know what the, was going to be in the course? I haven't given it yet. Okay, and then she went on to say, but we're not going to give in. If they don't like it, she said, they can take your course. That's what I've decided. And the, her, uh, John, the guy who works with her, uh, agreed with her, and so that's where I left it until I got the letter from the board of directors. So obviously what happened here, now this is conjecture on my part, is the rabbis and the Jewish Federation went over the head of the executive director. They went to the board, and the board caved in. So this is a, this is a, uh, a Catholic operation. It was created by Father Putz, if I'm, I, I think I'm correct in saying this, created by Father Putz for... Uh, older people, mostly Catholics, retired people, people who have time on their hands now so that they don't go stale intellectually, they can have their own courses. And so it would be Catholics talking to Catholics, but apparently Catholics can't talk to other Catholics unless they get the approval of the rabbis in South Bend, Indiana. Now this is, this is the situation uh, that we have, have reached here. Now, why is this significant? Who cares? Who cares out there? So what? You know, who cares that your course got canceled? Well, I think it's significant because it, it makes a number of things clear. First of all, I'm not, we are not supposed to know this, okay, that it was the rabbis who did it. That's not in Mr. Bowman's letter. Mr. Bowman says, when concern is expressed to us about its kind, well, he doesn't say who expressed the concern here. Okay, we're not supposed to know that uh, they did this. Now, why is that significant? Well, because this leads us into a whole realm of discourse. In other words, what we're seeing here is sort of the hidden grammar of public discourse in South Bend, Indiana. But not just South Bend, Indiana. We're, I mean, why is South Bend any different than any place else? What we're seeing is basically the hidden grammar of public discourse. And what does that hidden grammar involve? It means, I think, and I don't think, it, correct me if I seem to be exaggerating, that the goyim are not allowed to talk about Jews. Now, there's... We'll go from there. I think that's the that's a, a, okay. That's a pretty strong statement. But the goyim, a lot of people don't know what that word means. The goyim right? means people who are not Jews. That's. I think we can make a stronger statement than that. I think that uh, let's say one that would probably be uh, easier to defend. The goyim are not allowed to criticize Jews. Right, right, right. In other words, you could talk about Jews as long as it was always in a positive well, now, way. Well, I'm going, I'm going, uh, that may be the case. I'm going to dispute that. I don't think that the goyim are allowed to talk about Jews. But, at all. Because it, at it, all. It, it, at it, all. It, you know, be it, because, first of all, what you're, what you're saying here when you say that is that there, are, there is such a group as Jews. And that is another thing that you're not allowed to say. In other words, if you say that there is a group out there who are known as Jews who act in concert on certain things, you're guilty of anti-Semitism. And this is precisely what we found out with this course. Not only, there are a group of Jews, not all Jews, I'm not claiming it's all Jews, but I'm saying the Jewish leadership in South Bend, Indiana, acted in concert to get this course canceled. Prohibiting Catholics from talking to other Catholics about issues of concern that are based in uh, scriptural, have a scriptural basis. 
And for, okay. the, for the church fathers, Chrysostom and the church fathers, well, you know, the Jews were a very uh, important part of well, the are, are we Are we allowed to talk about this? And, and not only that, okay, let's say, are we allowed to talk about, let's say that passage that you just read from Thessalonians. Are we allowed to talk about that, first of all? Are we allowed to come up with our own interpretation of that without checking with the rabbis? And secondly, secondly, but more importantly, are we allowed to draw some type of conclusions about our lives from that passage? Well, when you say, are we allowed, or the wording was, you must stop, that implies that there actually is force behind. In other words, there's a threat. I mean, in other words, there's actually military, I mean... <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's military. Well, there were in Iraq. Well, I mean, well, that, now we're getting into another area. I mean, if you're talking about the Forever Learning Institute, I'm, I don't think that the Israelis are going to have an airstrike on the... No, but it does Institute. say must. You must stop. Why, why this, like, you know, like, what will happen if you don't? Well, that's, the, I mean, the threat is always open-ended. We don't know. And that's where, that's where either you, you press on and you find out, or you give up immediately, and then you never find out. But, but there's a threat involved here there Some, is a threat. somewhere. Isn't a threat even Ill, wrong in itself? Isn't that... Uh, well, I mean, let, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Okay. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me step back from this by, by analogy. Let's say, let's say uh, uh, 60 years ago, you know the Amish, those people that live over there, look like you with the beard, you know? <laughs> Uh, let's you know they're all Germans. You knew that. Oh yeah, I, right. Okay. Yeah, let's say let's say 50, sixty years ago that uh, the Amish uh, were making sure that Germany got eighty billion dollars in in uh, it had got eighty got a billion dollars a year. That eighty percent of our foreign aid went to Germany. Sixty years ago. Yeah. Right at the height of the. Okay. Let's let's assume that the Amish were heavily involved in lobbying Congress to make sure that 80% of our foreign aid went to Germany. And that included in this foreign aid was all of our most sophisticated weapons. All airplanes, submarines, and all that well, though it wasn't invented yet, nuclear, nuclear weapons or bunker buster bombs or whatever you want to call it. Now assume that that was the case and let's assume that no one was allowed to talk about it. In a free society. Well, now wait a minute. Now wait a minute. Where would that where would that lead us? Well, now let's let's jump ahead a, a, a couple decades, and w we have exactly the same situation. We have a situation where you know, eighty percent of our foreign aid money is going to Israel. We have a group uh, uh, known as the Israel Israeli lobby, or if you want to call it IPAC. Uh, uh, ensures that uh, congressmen will be punished if anything uh, jeopardizes this money or this aid. We have America sending its most sophisticated weapons over there, including bunker buster bombs that could be used against Iran. We have a war looming with Iran, in case you haven't noticed from reading the news. We are already bogged down in a disastrous war in Iraq, that was largely the doing of a group of people known as the neoconservatives, which was a Jewish-led political movement. Everybody knows this. I can say it, uh, but you can read Murray Friedman's book, Murray Friedman book, the, the neoconservative revolution. He says it. He was a member of the AJC. He says it. He brags about. It. He thinks it's a good idea. Okay, you can. This is the situation right now, and we are not allowed to talk about it. Now, how can we live in a free society that is supposed to, or supposedly free society, that is supposed to choose its legislators who then go on to make laws? How are we supposed to live in this society if we are not allowed to talk about these issues? Well, isn't, isn't there a, a threat somewhere behind this, hiding somewhere? Of course there is. Well, isn't, to threaten somebody, isn't that absolutely, isn't that like an assault? Well, ask Mr. Bowman. According to the law, he's, somebody to threaten you is an assault. Well, he's, Mr. Bowman's the one that got threatened, evidently, because he's the one. Well, then he was suicide. assaulted. He's, I don't know whether he was assaulted. I don't know what happened. If, so, if there's a threat of any kind, of any suggestion that behind something is a threat. Look, all I know is that the power of the rabbis is in direct proportion to the cowardice of the Catholics. And you will, cre you will increase their power the more you give in to their threats. And so here's a man who gave in to a threat, and so therefore their power has been increased. 
Okay? Now, what we're talking about here, we're talking about tactics that are not new. Okay? What we're talking about is the culmination of 60 years, 60, 50... What do you want to talk about? One with 45 to 2005, 60 years of a refinement of tactics of intimidation. Okay, now, you're going to listen to me. Who, who, who cares what Mike Jones thinks about things? Who is he? Okay? All I do is read books. And one of the books I read in this regard is a book by a guy, a man named Benjamin Ginsburg, obviously a Jewish fellow. The book is called Fatal Embrace, Jews and the State, published by University of Chicago Press, 1993. Okay, this is not fringy stuff, if, if you're scared by fringy stuff. And in this book, uh, Mr. Ginsburg goes into the tactics that get used here by Jewish organizations of the type that we're talking about here in town. During this period, and he's referring to the 50s, the American Jewish Committee developed a strategy it called Dynamic Silence to combat the activities of Gerald L.K. Smith. Working together, officials of the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, and the Anti-Defamation League would approach the publishers of major newspapers and owners of radio stations in the city where, where Smith had scheduled appearances to ask that Smith be given no coverage whatsoever. If newspapers and radio stations failed to cooperate on a voluntary basis, Jewish organizations were usually able to secure their compliance by threatening boycotts by Jewish advertisers. This strategy of dynamic silence was extremely effective in suppressing Smith and other right-wing anti-Semites. Okay? Now, I have a question for you. How do you know that it only got applied to right-wing anti-Semites? Is there, is there a, a committee out there is there some type of open... De now, this is, a, this is a group of people. This is Benjamin Ginsburg. He's Jewish. He's writing about Jewish organizations. He thinks it's a great idea that what they did. But basically, what we're talking about is these Jewish organizations have deliberately strangled any type of free discussion of ideas on anybody that they don't like. Now, they could say that they're anti-Semitic or they're right-wing, but what does that mean? What does that mean? There is, I think, a definition of anti-Semitism, okay, that I, I personally, I would agree with, I think all men of goodwill would agree with this. Uh, an anti-Semite is someone who wishes harm to Jews. He, uh, an anti-Semite is someone who feels that Jews uh, have some defect of character because of their racial inheritance, I'm saying this because the term was created by a man by the name of Wilhelm Marr in 1870 in Germany. And this was the era, 1870, as you probably know, was the high point of biological thinking. This is the high water mark of Darwinism, and the Germans are infected by this Darwinistic idea. And, the, and basically, it's also a time when you saw widespread abandonment of the categories of Christianity. Bismarck. Was Bismarck was, had just started the Kulturkampf at this time, so... What you're talking about is racial thinking. Okay, I agree. It's wrong to say that this man, simply because he's a Jew, is a bad person because he's got bad DNA, and no matter what he does, he can't change it. That is not my position. I have written against that position repeatedly. Well, okay? it's not true. It's not true. That's why it's not my position. I cannot accept that position. Okay? In what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here, what I was trying to do here in terms of the book I wrote, uh, was to go back to a more tenable position. It seems to me we have two extremes here. On the one hand, you've got that position. On the other hand, you've got the position which says that uh, anything a Jew doesn't like is anti-Semitism. Well, that's not a tenable anything position. Anything a Jew doesn't like? Yeah. What? I mean, if, if a Jew doesn't like what some, some, someone says, oh, then, that they, okay. uh, then that person is an anti-Semite. Okay. And it seems to me in this regard, or let's say uh, we've already discussed some of these issues, uh, anyone who, cl who criticizes Jews is an anti-Semite. Anyone who says the Jews act in concert to achieve certain ends is an anti-Semite. Uh, well, this is clearly, if that is the case, then what possibility is there for discourse? 
And if that is the case, then we have a whole tradition all the way back to Jesus Christ himself of wicked people who, who are simply irreformable and deserve to be demonized. And so uh, we've reached an impasse. I mean, you've got millions of Christians in this country who can, simply cannot give up uh, the scriptures. No Christian can give up the scriptures. The scriptures are full of this type of debate. They are full of descriptions of the conflict between Christians and Jews at that time. And I'm saying, so I, here I am. Why did I get involved in this project? Because what I saw and in the run-up to the war in Iraq was that the country was being commandeered into a war which was not in the interest of the United States by a group of people who were pri pri primarily Jewish, namely the neoconservatives. And the more you looked into the neoconservatives, you began to realize, well, they did have a kind of revolutionary pedigree. Who is the father of neoconservatism? It's Irving Kristol. His son was the, uh, is now editor of the uh, Weekly Standard. You see him on TV all the time. Well, what was Irving Kristol during the 30s? He was a Trotskyite. And so what you begin to see here now is certain similarities between, between the views of Trotsky and the views of the neoconservatives. Well, are we allowed to debate this or not? Is that anti-Semitism to say that Irving Kristol was a Trotskyite? And that that had some type of influence on this later movement known as neoconservatism? Well, if anybody's normal, of course, it's most urgent that it be debated. It's absolutely most urgent. And why, who would stop the urgency? Who's saying it's not urgent? Well, we know right now. This is why this is kind of a breakthrough moment. Because instead of all this vague, you know, behind-the-scenes stuff, we looked behind the curtain. And guess who was behind the curtain here in South Bend, Indiana? It was all the rabbis and the Jewish Federation. And they are the ones who want to stop discourse. And the people who, uh, the uh, Joan Loranger and the other executive director, uh, stood up to them and they were overruled. And the board caved in to this pressure. So how much, imp how much power do they have? If, I mean, these people seem to have said, we're going to take a strong stand. And all of a sudden, they're blown away. So they must have some power. Well, they, 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 they went over their heads. Where do they get their power from? They they're only, they're power, only two or three percent. Of power to, they get their power from the, the uh, in this instance, from the cowardice of the people who should have stood up to them. Now, do these people believe? Now, this is what they say. Everyone will say this. Yeah, we believe in the, the free exchange of ideas. We believe this is a free country. We're fighting for our freedoms, blah, blah, blah. And yet, when it comes down to it, there's no debate here. There's no debate. Now, I got started in this because I was concerned about this drift of our country into deeper and deeper doo-doo in the Middle East. It's been one catastrophe after another. The biggest debacle in American history. You can debate that. Are we allowed to debate this? Okay. Or, or, uh, uh, does this make me a, a bad person? Okay. And then I start to think, well, I'm a Catholic. I should be able to come up with some type of Catholic explanation of what happened here. And that's what led me to do the book. So in other words, you said there's no sense reinventing the wheel. We've, people have already uh, brought this issue to, to bear in the past, the, the church fathers, Chrysostom, and they've already said, here's, here's who a Jew is, here's how a Catholic ought to relate to a Jew. Well, it's not, it's not a new conflict. No, I just, and so the question is, well, suppose we go back to scriptures and we look at the conflict then between the Jews and the Christians at that time, will that, will that give us some type of elucidation of the mess that we are in today? In other words, will that help us to understand the mess that we are in today and help us to understand a way to get out of that mess? Right. Obviously, we go back to the scriptures, but if you're a Catholic, there's, there's probably volumes and volumes and volumes of books giving the Catholic position throughout the centuries on this well, issue. Yeah, so you're right. It's not just the scriptures, the church fathers. St. John Chrysostom, for example, wrote a, uh, a very strong treatise called Adversus Judeos against the Jews or against the Judaizers. And, uh, yeah, he has lots to say about this. He has lots to say about this. So, that's, so that sort of led up to the, the, uh, the idea. And then you go back there and then you begin to realize, well, maybe there is the germ of some type of idea here. Because what happened? I mean, we've, we've, I, I know we've gone over this before. 
This is no secret. I'm sure that every rabbi in town is going to be watching tonight because they keep tomorrow track. night, tomorrow night, wherever <laughs> it is, because they keep track of me. They're my most, they're my most faithful supporters in South Bend, Indiana. I know that what I say will get to the ears of every rabbi in town. Okay, so what we're, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? You go back to this conflict, and there was the conflict. I mean, Jesus Christ came. I've talked about this before. It's not a secret. It's in the magazine. It's, it's an, issue, an issue of culture wars. Jesus Christ came as, as he promised, as God had promised. And the Jews at this time have to decide, is this man the Messiah or is it not? And this causes all sorts of conflict within the Jewish community. And some of the Jews accept him. And some of the Jews reject him, and it begin, you begin to see that there is this conflict that's, that's, that's getting worse and worse. I, I think for somebody that's, that's looking in from the outside, and they know the scriptures, and, it's, and they, the Jews did say, his blood be on us and on our children. Well, the, the Jews that are in town that, that uh, called in and demanded that you not be able to teach that, what's their relationship to... His blood be on us and our children. Well, Do they I mean, claim to be the children? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. I'm, let's let's take a, let's go a step before that. I mean that we're to, we're at the end of the conflict at that point. It's just about over at that point. Before that, uh, something like the parents of the man born blind are being constantly asked. You know, was your son blind at birth? Because the the rabbis are saying he wasn't. It's just a, a trick. And the parents of the man born blind, after a while, got tired and intimidated, and they said, the scripture, St. John's Gospel says, parents of the man born blind refused to speak out of fear of the Jews because the Jews threatened to expel from the synagogue anyone who said that Jesus was the Messiah. So fear of the Jews is not something new. Now, we have to understand, what do you mean by fear of the Jews here? The parents of the man born blind were Jews too. But as you, what, you, what happens is that as the gospel evolves, as the conflict evolves, what you see is that Jew becomes a term which has a specific meaning. A Jew is a rejecter of Christ. That's what it means by the end of the gospel. And so the culmination of this comes with the, between the confrontation between Christ and the Jews. And the Jews say to Jesus, we have sacred DNA. We are sperma Abraham. And Jesus says, if you were children of God, you would do what I say. But you do not listen to me. And so you're not children of Moses. You're not children of Abraham. Your father is Satan. And at that point, they pick up stones and they're ready to kill him. And that's what eventually what happens. But they, they, they reach this, this conflict. Now, now I, I, gave this to, I gave a talk similar to this in Prague. A Jewish organization there writes a big headlines. Jones says Jews are children of Satan. Now, wait a minute. This is dishonest. This is the science. What you're saying, what you're telling me, and this again is the Jewish organizations and the rabbis, what you're saying is the Goyim cannot even quote scripture. They cannot quote the New Testament without being demonized by, these, by the thought police. Well, I'm sorry. This is intolerable. This is an intolerable situation. And when you get an intolerable situation, there's going to be a reaction at some point or other. And so what I'm trying to do is to let the whole thing down easy by coming up with the Christian alternative as opposed to uglier alternatives, which we have known in the past. Okay? That's what I'm trying to do. So we have this progression here, okay? The Jews uh, who rejected Jesus as the Messiah become more and more angry to the point where they decide they're going to kill him. And they collaborate with the Roman authorities, and at a certain point they say, he says, uh, are you going to kill your king? And they say, we have no king but Caesar. Well, these are, this is scripture. This is not just you know, magazine articles. These are, these are sentences that reverberate throughout history. And then they say, Gee, the pilot's trying to say, well, you know, let's, let's work out a deal here. I'll give you a choice between Barabbas and Jesus Christ. Well, who's Barabbas? Barabbas was a revolutionary. He said he was a notable prisoner. He was, he was a revolutionary. He had risen up in rebellion against Rome, and so the Jews chose Barabbas. Well, these are, as I said, these are deep moments in history. This is like the axial moment in human history, where the Jews choose 
uh, Barabbas. Well, what did they do? They they were, chose, in other words, they were backing his cause. We, we choose him, and we, well, we, we were mean. backing his cause. It's not like just I choose Pepsi over Coke here. I'm choosing Barabbas over Jesus Christ. Their missions. And they, yeah, that's, that's something that you base your life on, this type of thing. And Barabbas is a revolutionary. So what happens here at this crucial moment in history is that the, you know, the Jews choose this revolutionary. And in choosing a revolutionary, they become revolutionaries. Now, what is the essence of this Jewish revolutionary thought? Annas and Caiaphas stand in front of the cross. And they say to Jesus, if you come down from the cross, we will accept you as the Messiah. And so as a result, they have chosen, that they have decided that God has to fit their plans. If you want a Messiah, you better do, send us the one that we want, not the one that you want. And the one that we want is going to be a powerful political leader who is going to liberate well, it's the, same the one that Peter, the bondage of Rome. The same one that Peter was wanting. In other words, Peter was given the revelation, and then Jesus let him know he was going to go to Jerusalem to be crucified, and Peter tried to stop him, and right. Jesus said, Satan, get right. behind me. So in right. other words... No, nobody, who in his right mind would choose a, a crucified Messiah? Uh, not, Peter certainly didn't well, want no, it. I mean, no. in a sense, you can't. There's no reasonable. There's no no reasonable man would do it. A, a reason can, fails at this point. It has to be accepted by faith. And so, in a sense, this is the triumph. So, what you have here is a group of people who are, are rejecting, reject the Messiah who came, namely Jesus Christ, because he was crucified. Reject the cross. Now, when you reject Jesus, as I said, what are you, what are you rejecting? You're rejecting Logos. Because that's what St. John says at the beginning of the Gospel. Ein arche, ein ha Logos. And Jesus said, I am the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, but it's more than just Word. It's reason. It's rationality. But it doesn't it make order. sense. It's against reason to even accept the cross, and yet the cross is the definition of it's reason. It's the essence. So it transcends reason. At certain points, it transcends reason. But what you see here is all of these things have uh, incredible reverberations throughout history. If you reject Logos, uh, you become a, a proponent of the forces of disorder. And the forces of disorder are also known as revolution. And so once again, we're, we're back again to the whole idea of revolution. In rejecting Christ, you chose revolution. Okay, and in choosing revolution, uh, there are going to be severe consequences. But the, the, the choice of, I mean, can anyone deny that the Jews chose revolution? Heinrich Goetz, the father of Jewish historiography, certainly doesn't deny it. He calls all those people revolutionaries in his history of the Jews. And so what happens is, after uh, within 30, within 40 years of the death of Jesus Christ, the Jews got the revolution that they chose. They rose up in rebellion against the Roman authorities. They were able to finally achieve what they really were thinking. They got what they wanted. And sometimes it's always a dangerous proposition to get what you want because you have to want the right thing because otherwise you'll get something that will destroy you. And that is precisely what happened to the Jews. They got what they wanted and what they wanted destroyed them. Because after trying out a few generals, the Romans finally succeeded in taking back Palestine one city at a time until finally the Jewish... Uh, they took Jerusalem and the temple was burnt to the ground and without the temple the Jews have no religion anymore or they don't have a covenant they can't fulfill the covenant that they made because they can't engage in animal sacrifice and so at this point we have the creation of the new Jewish religion the one that exists today the religion of the rabbis the religion of the synagogues where basically there's no temple, there's no sacrifice, there's no priesthood. All we have is a debating society. And the codification of all these debates is known as the Talmud. And the Talmud becomes then the epitome of anti-Logos. The epitome of the hatred of Logos that results from the rejection of Christ. And so its hatred, of, it manifests itself in uh, a kind of sophistry that you find in the Talmud. It manifests itself, as Great says, in delight in cheating people. This is what, again, it's Heinrich Great's, it's not Mike Jones. History of the Jews talks about the corrupting effect that the Talmud had on Polish Jews. 
taking delight in cheating people. Now, if you take delight in cheating people, you're not going to make friends with your neighbors. And so there's been one sort of reaction after another. In Poland, it came to the, the Schmelnitzki pogroms in 1648, where the people got tired of being cheated, and they rose up, and it, it wasn't a happy time for the Jews. But the question is, why would they end up wanting to take delight in cheating people? Is that because of the, the perverseness of the human heart, or is it... I mean, that's what people are... People just have a hard time with accepting that. They, 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 you could tell them this, but they say, well, I don't know if I really believe that. I can't believe they really take well, the light I'm, I'm and I'm quote, uh, Well, I'm quoting Heinrich Graetz here, and that's what he said. Heinrich Graetz was a German Jew who did not particularly like the Ost, what, what we call the Ostjuden, the, the Jews who were living in Poland at the time, and felt that their moral character had been corrupted by studying the Talmud. That's a simple fact. It's in Heinrich Graetz's History of the Jews. Now, why? Uh, well, because uh, what is Logos? It comes back to Logos. What is the manifestation of Logos in terms of human behavior? It's known as practical, what Immanuel Kant would call practical reason. Practical reason is morality. Morality is reason applied to everyday life. Well, anti-Logos will be the opposite of morality. And so one manifestation of the opposite of morality is cheating people. Yeah, lying. Or, uh, morality lying, is cheating, honesty. And so on that. and so forth. And so that's, that's sort of what... Uh, that's what, what uh, one of the outcomes of that type of repudiation of Logos. So, but the, 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 the situation continues. It doesn't stop there. I mean, in a sense, what, what you're seeing now is what you would have gotten at the uh, Forever Learning Institute because I'm talking about the first, I mean, I would have given it in more detail, but we're talking about what would be the introductory chapter of the, of the, of the course. After, the, after the, uh, the destruction of the temple, uh, we have, 60 years later, another rebellion. They try again. They try again. Uh, actually, it started before that. In about, in about 115, there were rebellions all across uh, the, uh, Egypt and in uh, Crete uh, on, uh, to the north, in which the Jews rose up and slaughtered the uh, local population. And then there was a reaction again. The Jews on Crete uh, slaughtered hundreds, 100,000 Greeks, this is what the chronicler said, and then the Greeks returned and slaughtered every Jew on the island and then passed laws saying Jews were not allowed back on Crete, not even if they were shipwrecked off the coast. This is the type of violent reaction that this uh, revolutionary Judaism was causing throughout the classical world. And this time it reached its culmination with a man by the name of Simon Bar Kokhba, Simon Bar Kokhba came out of nowhere, nobody knows where he came from, uh, led the Jews in a successful rebellion against Rome once again, established the kingdom of Palestine completely independent of Rome, had coins struck with his image on them, which means that you were the sovereign of the land, and established basically the Jewish, one of many Jewish heavens on earth. Probably one of the first. And then what happened is the same thing that happened before. After trying out a few generals, they've, they finally got one general who knew how to do the job, which was basically you take one city at a time, you've got a land, people who are cut off from the sea, who every hand that holds the sword can't push the plow, and so as a result you starve these people into submission. And so one city after another fell until finally they're at uh, Bethar, taking their last stand at Bethar. It looks as if the Romans are ready to give up, but suddenly uh, some traders within the city give them the plans of the tunnels, and the Romans come through the sewer system and emerge, and a huge slaughter of the Jews takes place. And that's the end of that revolutionary period. Now, what I'm saying here, and the thesis of the book, and what would have been the thesis of the course, is that this, as long as the Jews uh, perdure in this rejection of Logos, they are going to be revolutionaries. And what you see is the, the periodic resurgence of these, of these Jewish, uh, this Jewish revolutionary idea throughout history. But basically the Jews, like St. Peter, you know, when, when they went to capture Christ, Peter gets the sword out and, and cuts off the, the, the high priest servant, Malthus's ear, and Jesus said, you know, 
put it back. You know, whoever lives by the sword will die by the sword. Right. I mean, so so Peter twice there, trying to stop him from going to Jerusalem, you know, gets into that revolutionary fervor. In other words, the cross is revolutionary in itself. No, it's well, yeah. I mean, if if you're going to confuse the issue, yeah, you can use the word revolutionary in an in an, in an equivalent type of term. But but it's natural for a man to be revolutionary, isn't that? I mean. If you, you could say original sin is a kind of natural rebellion because it began with Adam in his rebellion against the order established by God. So there is this natural inclination to revolution. But it's not inevitable because Jesus Christ came and proposed some type of alternative. He proposed logos and orderly society. But, but there's two voices, two siren voices what? appealing to people. Right. One I, is know. Re- I know, I know. And the point is, the point of Peter, a good point to make here, is that Christians are always tempted by this Judaizing heresy. And throughout history, we've had Christian movements where, in which the, the, the Christians have behaved like Jews. But, well, yeah, because Jesus, in, in Gethsemane, he kept telling them, now watch and pray. Watch and pray, lest you be entered into temptation. Now Peter goes to sleep. And well, what's the first thing that happens? Well, they come to Jesus, come to get him, and Peter gets out of the sword. sword. You're right. The temptation for Christians is always to grasp at the sword. Grasp for the sword. And the sword is in many ways the antithesis of the cross. Yeah, and then he denied Christ. So it was the denial so, so, and yeah, grant. Right. And, and what you see here, so, so to, you know, to jump ahead a millennium uh, when the... Uh, revolution breaks out in Europe at the time of the Hussite rebellion uh, in Prague in Bohemia what you see here are priests who are now carrying swords Hus uh, the best example of this would be Jan uh, Zelivsky, the monk who carries a sword, it's unheard of that a monk should carry a sword but why does he carry a sword? Well because he's constantly appealing to these figures from the Old Testament to justify his rebellion against the order, the social order. You're constantly referring to, well, we're like, I'm really Gideon. I'm not a thug. I'm not a bad priest. I'm Gideon. I'm Joshua. And these are the Amalekites, and we're going to smite them, and so on and so forth. And that becomes the rationale. It's the same thing that Peter was. Peter was tempted to pick up the sword, and so there are going to be Christians throughout history who are going to be tempted to pick up the sword. And all that really manifests is that they probably haven't been living a life of watching and praying. That's probably exactly true, because what we see in the reformers is they, uh, the so-called reformers is lives of decadence, oftentimes lives of sexual decadence at this time. And so what they do is they, they leap into these political movements to distract themselves primarily from their own uh, spiritual shortcomings. And they get swept up in a movement, a large political movement that is going to unite everyone. And suddenly the Hussites are now the chosen people of God. And we are God's holy people. And suddenly you see them uh, as imitation Jews. They're imitating the Jews. Kind of like America. I mean, it's how well, we, it's, our whole it, revolution. Well, I mean, this it, it does. So it, it's, it extends the crucial middle link between the Hussites and America is, of course, the Puritans in England, and the Puritans were Judaizers, and Judaizing means that you take some type of passage from the Old Testament and use it to justify revolutionary behavior, which is precisely what Cromwell did in justification for the murder of the king. Right. So he they, said he was like Phineas, you know, thrusting the sword through the or the spear through the copulating couple. Well, this is what they do, and this has been a constant throughout uh, history. That Puritan mentality came over to the United States, and it got over here, and there was lots of conflict. And you've talked about the conflicts here, like the Civil War, which was basically the conflict between two groups of English Protestants. Mm-hmm. The Puritans from New England were Judaizers. And they are the ones who led the fight in the Civil War. They were the heart of the abolitionists. And we see it all the way up to the present day. Now, that is the point of what I was trying to talk I was trying to bring this to bear in much greater detail than I'm going into right now. Bring all of this to bear to this group of people so that we could make some type of intelligent commentary on the politics that is driving this country right now. Because it seems to me this is the best way to approach the issue. Yeah, you're not going to understand the Iraqi war without bringing some of this information. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying there is this continuity in history 
where Jews are associated with revolutionary behavior. It goes all the way back to the cross, to the foot of the cross. It goes back to choosing Barabbas. It goes back to all of these things, and it's remained constant throughout this period. Now, do I expect every rabbi in town to accept this? No. Okay? But what, who gives them the right to, to prohibit me from talking to other Catholics about this? Who well, gives them the right? Well, at the time of Jesus, I mean, those soldiers were told, hey, don't worry. You guys, just say you fell asleep, which is normally punishable by death. We'll take care of it. Okay, so these, the soldiers were willing to say, yeah, we fell asleep, which normally you'd be put to death if they found out. But the Jews had so much power. They said, hey, you could, we'll even cover you for that. Just say they came and stole them. So apparently it's indicating that the, the, the Jewish leaders, and you would suppose even today, have one of their uh, ambitions is to get power with control over those in power. That's the thesis. Well, I mean, Ginsburg's book says that the Jews have always gravitated toward positions of power, but he says it's called fatal embrace because oftentimes the very princes they empower, uh, they turn on. Well, yeah, I mean... I mean, the, I guess the classic instance of this would be Stalin in the Soviet Union. You know, I mean, no one served Stalin more faithfully than the Jews. And then Stalin turned on the Jews. Well, the Jews helped create Stalin, right? I mean, well, I mean, the, the Bolshevism was like neoconservatism. It was a, a Jewish movement. It could not, I mean, Bolshevism was one small part of the revolutionary movement in in Russia during the 19th century. And the, the revolutionary movement in Russia, it is, could not have succeeded without Jewish support. I mean, after, for example, just to give you one example, after the, uh, the assassination of the Tsar, Alexander II, there was a crackdown. That was, what, 18? 1880. Okay. And uh, there was a crackdown, and the Jews uh, left places like Moscow and St. Petersburg, and they went back into the, down to Odessa, uh, or along the Pale of the Settlement, where they were beyond the reach of the Tsar's police. They just retreated into the shtetl, and they couldn't. Pre and this is where the re movement rejuvenated itself, and it came back, and it, evolved, it, it eventuated in the uh, the uh, revolution of 1917, when the Bolsheviks took power. It could not have succeeded without Jewish participation. Just uh, just a thought, which hopefully it fits in. Uh, Paul Fisher always said the Masons were Kabbalistic Gnostics. Is there a connection between? The Jews being revolutionary and the Masons being revolutionary, and yeah, I mean, I have the whole middle section of the book uh, goes from Protestantism as the vehicle of revolution to Freemasonry as the vehicle for revolution, and the crucial change took place at around 1660, at the time of the Reformation in England. By that point, every Englishman was sick to death of some wacko standing up saying, I am Gideon and I have the sword and you follow me. There were so many of these groups like the Shaker, the Diggers and the, uh, the Ranters and the Quakers that every, the Englishman got sick of them and so they, they didn't want any more and there was a, their king was restored and a new form of revolutionary activity arose and it was known as Freemasonry, which was based on Kabbalah. And there's a whole kind of complicated history that goes all the way back to Roy Kleen, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Neoplatonists in Italy, Reuchlin, brings Jewish Kabbalah into the Christian world. Uh, Agrippa, his student, takes it forward, and then John Dee takes it to England, and it becomes the basis of Elizabethan England. Kabbalah, and that leads, eventually leads to Freemasonry. I mean, that's another tall topic that we would have, would have covered in this thing. In that class. Yeah. Now, the Talmud and the Kabbalah, are they related then? Well, the, the, I, mean, the, I mean, Kabbalah is a, a particular group of books. Kabbalah is not as old as the Talmud. The Talmud was, co the Talmud was codified uh, in Babylon in around six, the 6th, sixth, 7th century. Kabbalah, the Zohar, wasn't written until, didn't come into existence until the time of the Albigensian Crusade, which is to say the 13th century in France. Albigensianism and Kabbalah sort of came into, came into existence around the same time. The culmination of Kabbalistic thinking was uh, the, the Jewish Messiah, one more Jewish Messiah, false Messiah in English, Shabbatai Zivi, was deeply influenced by Kabbalah. Heinrich Graetz does not like Kabbalah. He calls the Zohar that lying book. So there's all this sort of uh, uh, debate about uh, 
the effect, the bad effect of Kabbalah on, on the Jews at that time. But the Jews today generally are not into the Kabbalah as much. Well, there's they are, certainly they're some, some, but the some Talmud are. is mainly Well, there. the Talmud has a different kind of status. The Talmud is the heart of the Jewish people. That's what it says in the Jewish Encyclopedia. And what you have in the Talmud is this essence, this kind of distillation of anti-Logos. And that is going to have consequences. And what we're doing now is living through the consequences. But what I'm saying here is, if, if we live in a world where, okay, no one now is exempt from the charge of anti-Semitism. Jimmy Carter has written a book about Israel. He is now called, considered an anti-Semite. Just yesterday, there was a professor from uh, Indiana University, Bloomington, who was reported in the New York Times, has written an article for the American Jewish Congress criticizing Jewish anti-Semites. In other words, any Jew, this, it was in the New York Times yesterday, okay, any Jew who criticizes, he's saying Israel, but what we're talking about, if a Jew criticizes the party line, he's an anti-Semite. Now, what we're seeing here is this sort of thought control process of demonizing anybody who disagrees, this process is now run amok. And we are in this mess in foreign policy because this policy has been in effect for a long time. And we have been prohibited from discussing the things that we are discussing here today. And when you're prohibited from doing it, you cannot make intelligent decisions of the sort that voters in this country are supposed to make. But the reason that what you're saying is important is because without some reason dialogue here, his, history says there'll be a backlash. There will be a backlash. This is what Ginsburg says. This is the whole hidden history of fatal embrace. That at a certain point, uh, everything goes too far. I think we've reached the point where it's gone too far. And then there's a backlash, and lots of people get hurt. So if you're going to stifle rational debate, you're going to promote this type of pressure which will explode at a certain point. Like it did with the Germans. As it did in Germany during the 20s and the 30s, all throughout Eastern Europe, there was a backlash to the excesses of Bolshevism. Bolshevism was perceived as a Jewish phenomenon, and that's what caused the reaction. So that was not, I don't, I don't recommend that stuff. I am not one of those people. I am talking as a Christian, okay, saying that it's in the Jewish interest to look at the Christian solution to this problem, or at the very least, it's not in the Jewish interest to prohibit Christians from talking about this issue. It's not in your interest. So you're, you're actually pleading with the rabbis in a sense, I'm saying willing, it's completely I, in their interest that listen, you have I'm this. I'm willing to talk to the rabbis. I don't, ga I don't engage in character assassination. I engage in open debate. It's the rabbis who went behind my back to the cowards who were on the board of directors of the Forever Learning Institute and made them cave in. That's not the American way. I'm proposing the American way, which is open debate. And I'm still open to open debate because I know that the rabbis are watching this program. They watch this program. They keep tabs on me. I know that for a fact. But like Jesus came, not he, he just, I didn't come to bring peace but division, but obviously but he came in the mold of a peacemaker, but it still caused division. Right, and I guess I'm in the same mold here. Uh, we aspire to follow Christ, he's our model, and so we're gonna end up in the same type of situation. Misunderstood. Misunderstood, I'm trying to clear up the misunderstandings. No hard feelings to the rabbis, but I'm saying this was a mistake. You shouldn't have done this. For their own, for their own safety, because there'll be a backlash. There will be a backlash and you shouldn't have done this. And if you're smart, you will engage in the dialogue that I'm proposing. What are they afraid of, ultimately? What is their Listen, worst fear? I think, I think what you should do is ask the rabbi. Get one of the rabbis to sit in my, my seat. Okay? And you can have him on here and you can say, why did, you, why did you have Mike Jones's course canceled? What are you afraid of? Well, we're, we're living in the days of psychology. So obviously... This is a psychological. This raises a question. Okay, for if a you want, if you, right, you, you want me to be psychologist, I'll put on my psychologist hat. What is the Greek word for fear? Well, phobia. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Phobia also means hatred. So hatred and fear are related, and we see this in the gospel because perfect love casts out fear. So hatred is going to foster fear. Now, hatred is a Jewish virtue. That's not my idea. That's in first things. Rabbi Sokolov said that in first things. Okay. 
So hatred and fear are bound up in one concept that's known as phobos. It's the Greek word phobia, and that's what we're talking about. Or if you're talking about the psychological gestalt that we're talking but about. It's amazing that the people that are labeled anti-Semitics are also the ones that are accused of hate crimes. Well, that, They're the ones that have wait, the Wait, now, wait a minute. You can be an anti-Semite. You can hate Jews. I mean, I'm not denying that there are such people out there. I'm just saying, hey, I'm not one of them. And if you use this term promiscuously, the way it's being used, like Tony Jute, is he an anti-Semite? Norman Finkelstein, is he an anti-Semite? Steven Spielberg, he's an anti-Semite too. If you use this term as promiscuously as you're doing, there's going to be a backlash. It's already happening. The New York Times just did an article in which the title of the article is, Does Abe Foxman Have an Anti-Anti-Semite Problem? Now, you know, <laughs> when the New York Times starts to get on Abe Foxman's case, you know that something's out of control. Okay? How many times are you going to scream, Gewalt, Abe? It's like the guy who called Wolf, you know, too many times. We have reached this point, okay, where we need some type of uh, uh, modus vivendi, uh, a way of living together. Okay, and, and, and a way out of this vicious cycle of char character assassination. This is not going to lead to good for anyone. And I'm saying it's time to get over it. Let's get over the assassination business. Let's get back to being uh, the dialogue that is uh, always being talked about but never really happens. Right, because unofficially there's been some, somewhat of a marriage in a practical sense between the Christians and the Jews. And, the, and it's like in a normal marriage there has to be a certain way of functioning. And isn't it in the Catholic position, the, the old, the, in, in the old school, there was a way that Jews and, and Christians functioned, right? It was, that was harmonious at times. And there was always tension. I mean, uh, let's not kid ourselves. There was always tension. But they still... There but was you can... I think that it, the Catholic position, if, if you articulate the Catholic position, it is traditionally known as secret judeus non. And according to this position, I mean, it's basically a two-part position. It was formulated by Gregory the Great in the 7th century. It is the position of every pope ever since that time, Inclu up till Cardinal Hlon's uh, pastoral on morals in Poland in 1936. And basically, it's two parts. On the one hand, no one has the right to harm a Jew. On the other hand, the Jews do not have the right to subvert the morals or the faith of the population at large. Now... I mean, this is not, what should I say? This is not exactly chumminess, but it's a formula that will preserve social order. So what you see in our day is basically only focusing on one part. If you say, okay, no one has the right to harm a Jew, end of story. Well, that just leaves the Jews carte blanche to do the type of stuff they're doing. To run, to, 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 to tyrannize over discourse in South Bend, Indiana, saying we have veto power over whatever gets said here. Well, that's not going to lead to any type of understanding. We have to oppose that. We have to oppose, as decent people, we have to oppose this outrageous behavior at the time of the war in Lebanon. We're, I've talked on this program about that, where Charles Krauthammer says, hey, we don't have to follow the just war theory. That's a Christian idea. We can kill, we can, we can destroy the entire infrastructure of uh, Lebanon. We don't have to be proportional. Well, no, that's not going to lead anywhere. And, if, and if, I'm, if I'm demonized as an anti-Semite, if you're demonized as an anti-Semite for saying that type of thing, well, where is that going to lead? It's going to lead to where we are right now, which is on the brink of nuclear war with Iran. That's the news. That's where we're headed. And now, how do we get there? By this constant demonization of any type of discourse on the role that these people have in our foreign policy. But, it, but if a phobia... It, this fear and phobia is dominating the neocons and, and those people, then they're blindly leading us into disaster. Well, look, the traditional iconography of Jews is blind. Synagoga is blind. So when, you, when, when Bush takes their advice uncritically, which it seems like he's been doing the last many years, he's, they don't know where they're going. No, you don't know where you're going. I mean, if you go to this... The entrance to the uh, cathedral in, Sh in Strasbourg, there's an image of synagogue, and it's a, uh, a blindfolded woman standing there. That's the image of the Jew. The Jew is blind. I mean, the traditional reason is, well, Christ came and they didn't see it. So how much, how much, well, obviously they were blind. But the blindness has other meanings as well. 
And blindness in this regard means you're rushing headlong into catastrophe. Like they did, the revolution after, the, the, the first, what, 40 years after Christ, they did one, and they did another one, and they, and did, they, did, another did, one. they did three. Then they did the Schmelnitsky pogroms, then they followed Shabbatai Zivi, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, this was, in a sense, what the course was going to be in detail. You know, one, the entire 2,000-year period of history dealing with this issue, which is basically viewing the Jews from a Catholic perspective. You know? Now, obviously... There's going to be disagreement here. But what, what are you saying? That the Catholics are not allowed to view the Jews from their own perspective? Are we allowed to read scripture? I, I mean, what, what type of tyranny has been instituted here while we weren't looking? Well, the rule is you're offending somebody. And if you offend somebody and they complain... No, you're offending the wrong people. That's what, you, that's what we're saying. Because right. you can go, you can offend all kinds, all kinds of people, and it, it will be defended as art and forthright this and blah blah blah. And so there's always going to be someone justifying. But this is, but like like uh, Jesus said to Paul, you you you, you uh, you're going up against the pricks, or how is that? You know, when he's on the Damascus Road, he says, "Why are you um, you're fighting up against a wall?" Okay. In other words, the Jews, Jesus said. If you take up a sword, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. The revolutionary route doesn't work. You got trouble with the Romans? Jesus said, then go, they, they're forcing you to carry their pack. Go an extra mile then. I know. This is the, this is the Christian response. But we, uh, uh, for various reasons, have internalized the gospel of revolution. And so we don't even recognize it when we, when we see it. We have, we have become, I mean, we have become by nature rebellious. I mean, if, if you want to, I mean, we could go into other things, but I mean, uh, Yuri Schleskind's book, The Jewish Century, says that modernity is Jewish. Well, we've all become moderns, and so to that extent, we've all become Jewish. We have all internalized the, the, the categories of the Talmud, and so as a result, we have become alienated from our own, from our own tradition. And the church is not... Making well, you, the separation. Well, we, you try. So you go back to the sources and you try and rectify this, and you work. You cause this. All of a sudden, you have this incredible hostility. You know, and you demonize for what? I mean, for what? What am I? What am I doing here? I'm writing a book. I'm trying to teach a course. It's based on the scriptures. I gave this description to the people. They approved it, and suddenly it was vetoed by the rabbis. But basically, you're being accused of being the troublemaker and the re and the one that's in rebellion. Well, I guess I am. I guess I am. But the cross is not a sign of rebellion. No, it's a sign of submission to a higher power, if you want to put it that way. You know, a superior power that will that the Christian will triumph through suffering. Right. The Christian method is uh, uh, they, Jesus listened to the oppression there. He says, "I'm hearing all this oppression. The Romans. Here's what I'm telling you to do: when they force you to take that pack, go an extra mile, and when they slap you in the face, turn the cheek." Well, this they is, didn't want to hear that. No, this is not the revolutionary credo. The revolution is always take up the sword. Take up the sword. Defend your rights. And it invariably leads to a situation that is worse than the one you started with. I don't, <laughs> I don't know of any revolution that has led to something better. If you, can, if you know one... You could point it out to me. We could discuss this in the course. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, that was the if purpose of the course. If there were going to be a course, we could have all these people out there and saying, well, I think, what about this? Or what about what about the American Revolution, for example? We could get into that whole issue. To make things you know, better. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, we could get it. Was it a revolution? Was it? You know, all this type of stuff is the reason you have a course as opposed to just having a kind of monologue. But, I mean, in a sense, we don't know whether it's over or not, I mean, this, this particular incident. I mean, maybe an opportunity will arise where I could give it in spite of the rabbis. I mean, all, in a sense, all I need is someone to say, okay, I have a group, we'll sponsor your talk. We'll sponsor your series of talks, and we'll hold it at such and such a place. And if that's the case, well, then I'm willing to do it. But the person has to be willing to stand up to the rabbis. Because if you don't, you're just wasting my time and you're just making things worse. Now, was there any uh, platform for an appeal of this? I mean, normally, there's you can dialogue. Say, you know, what's you know what happened? Uh, can I appeal your decision? Uh, 
was it kind of heavy-handed, or was there any was there any freedom for discussion on the issue, which is what it should be? It says the the letter from Mr. Bowman says we can, however, begin the process of reviewing the course for consideration in the fall if you are still interested in teaching a class. Well, why would anything change? I mean, what, what, what do you, th you think the rabbis are not going to object? I mean, I, I, I perceive this as fairly hollow because I've already submitted a summary of the course. I've, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to give the course and then you listen to every word and then we'll decide whether you're going to give the course or not? I mean, you know, I've already, t I've given you a summary today. I gave a summary of this to the lady who approved the course. What, what more is there? I mean, th this strikes me as just hollow. Well, maybe their argument that the course is just not relevant. We need relevant courses like knitting to deal with the issues well, of the I'm, day. I don't want to badmouth knitting. <laughs> well, I'm saying I'm not, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to jump in and say you're not allowed to learn knitting <laughs> out there. Go ahead, learn knitting. I'm just saying, why can't I be like the knitting course, you know? Don't you think what I have to say is just, at, let's say, at least as valuable as knowing how to knit? Well, maybe you came close, but it must have fell a little bit short <laughs> of the value of knitting. I don't, far be it from me to badmouth the knitters out there. Well, knitting is very therapeutic. That's right. Um, so what's the plan? So then you wanna, um, I just wanna see, I want to come on TV? No, I, I just want to see what their, uh, we'll see what their reaction is. There are a number of things that I'm, avenues I'm going to pursue. I've gotten a lot of calls from people who want to know why the course was canceled. I, I think, to be honest with you, I, I've, I've composed a little uh, uh, statement here. I just composed that, stating my case. I, th I think that the, uh, the forever learning people have done me a disservice. They have they have treated me badly. Well, they haven't defended you. I mean, they they, 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 they said we're on I, your team. And I, all of a sudden, they asked me. Now I didn't go to them. They asked me. Maybe yeah. And absolutely. then and then they said, now tell us what it's going to be. And I, I fulfilled every single requirement that they came up with. And as of as of January 18th, I was on board. It was only when the rabbis jumped in and and tried to intimidate the board that they changed their mind. So everything was okay until the rabbis came in here. So it's not my fault. It's not my fault. They caved into that pressure. They had accepted the course. It was acceptable. So I think they, they treated me badly. And I think they have an obligation to me at this point, at least to tell the people who signed up for the course the real reason why it was canceled. Well, the question is, were they acting as good, faithful Catholics in, uh, by reversing their decision? Well, why, explain to me how that's possible. No, because a good faithful Catholic would be, oh, well, John Chrysostom is more of the Eastern Church, but you still had a, the position of the, the fathers of the church is consistent. They wanted well, I, this I, information I, I think I think my position is consistent with the Catholic position. I think that everything I've said to, tonight is consistent. I mean, you can judge what I've said tonight. If there's anything that I said that is not, I'd like to know about it. In a sense, that's why you have a course. So you can have people out there who say, no, well, when you said this, it's not really that way. Well, that's what most courses are today. Obviously, you don't expect the teacher to say everything that you think is right, or why would you be there? You, 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 you... Well, no, they, then you have academic freedom. But uh, there is no academic freedom. Academic freedom has become a joke. Uh, and so that's why uh, we're talking about the Forever Learning Institute as opposed to uh, what's St. Mary's College, maybe, or something like that, you know, where you would never get the possibility of even uh, proposing a course. So a course like this, when Notre Dame probably well, no, would, they not, have, would they not have, have a course they like have, this. They have, I mean, I've, I've been through this already at Notre Dame. I was given, I was uh, asked, once again, I'm asked by a group of students to give a talk. They're doing... Uh, a series, a lecture series, and they want me to talk on Protestantism. So I said, well, uh, I'd like to give a little bit of a different point of view. I'd like to talk about the Hussites as the beginning of the Protestant Revolution. You don't usually hear about that, but anyway, I think I can make a good case. So they say, fine, okay, you can talk about the Hussites. The day of my talk, I get calls saying, well, we ran out of money and we don't know whether, I said, okay, you can pay me when you can. 
Okay, because I think I'm sure it wasn't a lot. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. What's what's the money problem here? You come up with well, we're having trouble finding a room, and so what you're hearing is lies. Okay, because I know what happened. What happened is exactly what happened here. I even know the name of the rabbi in this instance. It was Elliot Barkey, who was a professor, a Jewish professor at Notre Dame, who was the moderator of this Brownson Club, and he the rest said, is Brownson. That's who the club's named after. Wow. And Elliot Barkey said, this man is an anti-Semite and you have to cancel his talk. And the students were caught in a bind and so they decided not to because I insisted that I didn't want the money at this point. So I went and there was uh, Professor Barkey sitting as close to me as you are now and I gave my talk on the Hussites. Well... After the talk, there is this dead silence. Any questions? No questions. And then finally, a little bit of you know hesitant and a few questions on the part of the students. At this point, um, the discussion is over. Professor Barkey grabs the, uh, the guy who is the moderator of the club, takes him into the room, closes the door behind him, and then chews him out for... From what I've heard later, choose him out for having me speak. And then he says, and this is what I got later from other sources, there were lots of mistakes in what he said. Oh, well, that's all. Oh. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Isn't this why we have questions? I mean, you were, this guy was sitting three feet away from me and asked no questions. Well, it seems to me you had the, the ideal opportunity. Well, in court, if you, if you don't object when your time to object is... Well, uh, I mean, uh, once again, I mean, I hate to say, but uh, I see a pattern emerging here. Uh, the rabbis don't believe in debate. The rabbis believe in blacklisting, and they believe in character assassination, and they believe in intimidation. And if I'm wrong, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. But that's what I've experienced. Well, what do you think about even somebody labeling somebody an anti-Semitic? Isn't there some responsibility for accusing somebody of that? I mean, can you just arbitrarily accuse somebody of anti-Semitic, even if it's not true, and then no and problem? Then what? And then what, what would you suggest? Uh, what's, what's the recourse that we have? The Bible, the court of the, law? Well, the Bible says if you accuse somebody of something that turns out not to be true, then you are to be punished according to... To the nature of the accusation. So, what's the worst thing that you can imagine if you say that person's anti-Semitic? Okay, so you, you you conjure up an image of how bad this person probably is. Well, that's supposed to be the judgment put on him then if it's wrong. So, so the the bind he's trying to put you in, the the, the restriction of freedom he's trying to, you know, put upon you, has to come back on him if it's wrong. Well, what's the mechanism? Or, or, or what are we talking about? Society has to create the balance. Okay? A well, healthy we, culture... We live in a society that is completely out of balance. Well, there's going to be a backlash. Is what I, well, what I'm, trying to ending. I'm trying to avoid the backlash. That's what I'm trying. I'm trying to diffuse the backlash through rational discourse. That is what I'm trying to do. But, but being that accused is, of being... I, I, am a, I am a writer and a man of reason, a man who is devoted to logos. And this is the method that I'm trying to... to uh, methods I'm trying to bring to the table here. But not everybody that's being accused of being anti-Semitic will be, have a Christian response. No, I know. Okay, And it's not, it's not fun being called an anti-Semitic, right? It's not something you, you just can't wait to have people no, accuse you no, of. No, of course not. Of course not. And a, a person that's not a, a real Christian may respond in quite a, a revengeful way. Well, history is full of instances where there's been violent reaction. And as I said, I'm trying to diffuse violent reaction. That is the purpose of teaching courses. That is the purpose of discourse, to bring reason to bear on a problem. Now, if you don't think we have a problem, then uh, I, I question your judgment. Because the situation is dire. Uh, that's how I would describe it. The world situation is dire right now. No, you just uh, finished, and your book will be published in September. I think the name of the book is Revolutionary Jew. No, it's the, the, the Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. Okay, the Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. Yeah. It's, it's finally going to be published. You it finished be, the book a, how long ago, a year ago? No, uh, about six months ago. Okay, so it will be published in September. And 
the book, because I was reading Robert Sugenis, the Catholic apologetic, and somebody, I, I said this on the show, somebody asked him, you know, I want to know about the history of the Jews, and he said, well, the book you ought to read is e. Dr. E. Michael Jones' book on, uh, I don't know what he said the title was, but apparently... It's the Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. It will be out in uh, October. Some people think that this is a good book, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, some people, it's changed a lot of people's uh, uh, thinking. As I said, uh, chapters of it have appeared as articles in Culture Wars. So I've been, you know, getting feedback for, you know, four years now or so. Uh, so, yeah, I think it is a good book. And, and what, what is its basic message? In other words, how people, what have some people thought about Jews or the, the subject? And by reading your book, what, what's the nature of their change in thinking? What? Well, I mean, it, it attacks the racial uh, attitude, which I which I would term anti-Semitism. In other words, there's no there's no DNA that we're talking about here that makes you act in a certain way, or there's no sacred DNA. I mean, this is what the Jews said to Jesus: they had sacred DNA. Well, and the same would go to the blacks. I mean, the history of this country: the blacks were the offspring of Ham. They were locked into a certain you know, they were they're definitely going to be this way. I mean, so people do tend to think this way, right? I know. Racial thinking is part of American history. And I've, I, I, I am not part of that tradition. I disagree with it. I think it's stupid. Whether, whether you're talking about blacks or whether you're talking about Jews or whether you're talking about Aryans or whoever you're talking about. This DNA stuff is not the source of your behavior. No, because I, 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 the Christian church has never taken that position. It has never taken that position. The G, I mean, it's in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ, when the Jews come to Jesus and they say, we are the seed of Abraham, uh, the implication is, well, we're going to be saved because we have D, a certain kind of DNA. We're special. We're special. We're the chosen people. And Jesus says to him, says to them, if you were children of God, you would accept me. Now, a child is different than a chemical. A child is something that thinks and acts. And that's what we're talking about here. You have to behave in a certain way. Right. Who are my... And so, and so, the, and so uh, what I'm saying here is that Jewish identity was fixed not because of some type of DNA. It was fixed in rejection of Christ. And to the extent that Jews perdure in this rejection of Logos, they will have this, this negative identity. Right, right. And, and, you know, you can boil it down, you can seem like there's two, two decisions a person has to make. And uh, one is, of course, whether to receive Christ. But then after you've re received Christ and, and you've received the Christian uh, position, then within that, there's all the Judaizers. Right. Within that, there's another decision to make. Right. Okay. Which Jesus are you going to follow? In a sense, are you going to follow the, the the Barabbas revolutionary, the Judaizing? Right. And it's attempt, as you said, the, the the passage from Scripture where Peter picks up the sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus is an indication of the perennial temptation that Judaizing presents to Christians. Right. So, so the, the perennial temptation to pick up the sword and engage in revolutionary behavior as the thing that's going to solve all of our problems. So, so the main emphasis, once you become a Christian, the main emphasis is now, here's the essence of Christianity. It's humility. It's uh, turning the cheek. Those kind of Patient teachings. Patient suffering. Yeah, that's the essence. You know, I wish to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And once you, less, once you let it lose grip of that, and there's no longer a life of watching and praying, then you're going to, probably going to be swept up in some revolutionary movement. Yeah. I mean, no one says that uh, every... Every revolutionary is a Jew. It's not true. Or that every Jew is a revolutionary. But that doesn't change the fact that these revolutionary movements have been led by Jews. Bolshevism is one of them. Neoconservatism is another one. I mean, we, what we're talking about is this, this historical uh, repetition, this, this kind of fatal attraction that always ends badly. But Right. Revolutions simply don't work. Isn't that the main... I mean, we think revolutions work because the American Revolution, Fourth of July, oh, it was a great success. Isn't that what we always want to think? Right. The word, I mean, the word is used in a very promiscuous fashion. And it's confused a lot of people. 
but uh, I mean revolution in the sense that uh, began in Europe uh, in let's say 1410 with the Hussites and proceeded all the way up till 1917 with the Bolsheviks has led to nothing but sorrow and death. If you have some other view of it, you know, I'd be happy to entertain it, but that's my opinion. I don't see, I don't see anything, any great progress resulting from these revolutions. But like my, uh, my nephew, I was just visiting in uh, Missoula, Montana, on the way to Portland. Now, he's, uh, grad he's only 20, he's in graduate classes, he's majoring, double major in Spanish and Latin American history. And, you know, for six, for a break, he went, or part of his class, he went down to Mexico to study, and he joins up with the Zapatistas. I mean, that's his identity. And, yeah. and of course, he, he doesn't believe that anybody, there should be any authority. I mean, he's a complete anarchist. Yeah. But the teachers, I mean, they're just, oh, they love him. You know, so what's going on here? Why do these teachers just love him to take this path? Of, he's an atheist, an anarchist. Oh, isn't that what education teaches you to do? to reject uh, order and embrace some type of revolutionary ferment? Isn't that what revolution, isn't the, that what education has become? The, the, the more he takes that revolutionary position, the higher his grades get. I mean, it's just, and they give him authors, I mean, and the teachers themselves, like the, the teacher he has, I said, well, where's this, this teacher from that you like so much, a woman teacher? Uh, I said, is she married or something? Well, he, he said, well, she was married. Well, who's she married to or what, you know? Well, she was down in Chile, and she met this real wild revolutionary, and they got married, you know, during the Allende days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then, of course, they got divorced, of course, and now she's back up, you know, and propagating her, her wild stuff. But this is, the, this is what you're going to find. Yep. Yep, I agree. I agree. And you used to teach, and uh, so you have a... Yeah, but what happens when the uh, when the rev the institutions of order are taken over by revolutionaries? Then revolution gets taught as the as the norm, in one form or another. And uh, that's that's what I'm trying. I mean, I'm trying. What I'm trying to do is propose some type of uh, paradigm where we can make sense out of this. This is a long period, and it's confusing. I mean, think of the confusion that we all felt with the, the abuse of the word conservative. How long has it taken us just to sort that one out? You know? The yeah. use of that word. Yeah, with Edmund Burke, it was not that confusing, right? Well, I mean, it's, it, take, it took on a meaning that was the antithesis of what it meant, and then suddenly being... A, I mean, there was a battle in the early 90s when Pat Buchanan was demonized. Remember, he was demonized as an anti-Semite. For what? for saying that America should not become involved in these imperial enterprises. Well, he was defeated, and now look what happens. Now we are involved in these imperial enterprises, and it looks like disaster looming on the horizon. Well, this is what happens when you, you know, this is what happens when you prohibit this type of rational discussion. Which is what the universities are basically, that's what they're there for, and yet it's not happening. They're there to prohibit rational discussion under the guise of... Uh, uh, promoting education, and that's that's part of the problem here. That's part of the problem we have to face up to. So we got this whole uh, credibility problem that needs to be uh, straightened out, and that's what I'm trying to do. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring order to chaos. Look at the look at the the, the recent uh, history of all of this back and forth, all of these confusing terms. All of these people who thought, well, we thought you believed this, but it turns out that you believe that. A great quote. I mean, I just got done uh, writing a piece on, uh, on Mel Gibson's movie Apocalypto and the change in thinking that uh, uh, Apocalypto shows over the course of Mel Gibson's career. I mean, what is America now? America is this place where doom seems to be approaching. The metaphor for America is this Mayan kingdom of slash and burn farmers who have destroyed everything and everything is going down the drain. There's no f crops growing anymore. And so they have to restore fertility by capturing the, the hunter-gatherers that live in the forest. And then they march them up the pyramid and they cut their hearts out. Well, this is, this is where, you know, this is one indication of the, the sense of doom that is in well, the air. Overtaking, yeah. 
the sense of doom. And and you go to so the end of the movie uh, we have uh, you know the the main character, the hunter gatherer that gets captured doesn't get his heart cut out, and there's an eclipse of the sun and the uh, the whole priest the priest manipulates this into some type of sign of approval, and he's set free uh, if he can outrun the spears of the people that are chasing him. And he actually does. He makes it into the forest until the last, the last hour of the film is basically Jaguar's paw escaping and killing his, his, uh, his pursuers until finally he's exhausted and he comes and he staggers onto the beach and can't go any further. There are two guys behind him. They're ready to bash his brains in. And they look up and there are these Spanish galleons sitting at anchor and there are two boats being rowed in and one has a conquistador and the other has a, uh, a monk, Franciscan monk in it. So what's he saying here? This is, this is in theater, this is called the deus ex machina. In other words, he gets saved by the deus, the god of the machine. And the god of the machine is Christ. And so I think that what he's, uh, what he's saying here is that this, this culture, at a certain point, cultures become so corrupted that they can't be reformed. And, and Gibson's almost, is basically trying to... Get, I, think that's, I think that's the point of the movie. I mean, it gets, it gets ambivalent, a little bit more ambivalent at the end. But I think that's what he's trying to say here, that this is a culture that has become so corrupt that it can't be reformed from within. Yeah, I think, I think that's what a lot of people are saying. I, I, my cousin's out there in Portland, and he grew up in Madison, and, and uh, he's very liberal. I mean, ACL type of lawyer. And, um, but now he's trying to, now he's reevaluating things, and he just can't believe how people are in such fear. You know, he grew up, no fear at all. I mean, back in those, the 60s, and he just did anything he wanted. But fear is, it's being recognized. People are being taken over by fear. Is that part of what he's saying? Uh, yeah, well, we have the manipulation of fear. I mean, isn't that what these orange alerts are all about? Yeah, I mean... And a red alert. Is it a red alert or a red, an orange alert? And now what we're hearing, I mean, I'm, uh, the message I heard this morning on the radio is that Iran is manipulating the situation in Iraq. And there may be another 9-11 going to happen. <laughs> The jet fuel. Well, I mean, this is what we're. Wait a minute. Who's 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 trying to scare whom here? I mean, are we are we getting ready? Are we going through the same old demonization process that we went through with Saddam Hussein in Iraq to demonize the people so that we will look justified when we do something when we attack them? Well, either way, it's fear. Either way, you're generating fear. Uh, either fear of that the Iranians are going to do something, which I don't believe, or fear that we are go that the United States is going to provoke something, in which case the United States will uh, uh, do something, which I think is at this point more realistic, given our track record in Iraq and the weapons of mass destruction story that uh, we never found. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Either way, it's fear. And so what you see is a culture that is beginning more and more run by fear. And the only way to overcome fear, at least on one level, is, well, I hate to use the word, but education, but shining light. Because once there's light and there's discussion and there's knowledge, uh, fear tends to have to back off. But that's precisely what they don't want. No, look at what happened here. I mean, we could have explored this issue in a rational way, but no, that, that discussion was stopped. Now, what you're seeing here is this locus, as I said before, the, word, the Greek word is phobos, and it's hatred and fear. And so what you're seeing is this combination of hatred and fear, the one feeding on the other. You know? And I, I don't, I mean, what's education? I'm a, I think that love drives out fear, and that's what we have to pursue. And, and uh, love of what? Well, love of logos, faith in logos. Faith yeah. in Logos that we, uh, in every sense of the term. Well, First Timothy says that the goal of our instruction or the goal of our education is love from a pure heart, a sincere faith. So obviously love, education, if it's good education, aims toward fulfillment. Well, no, it aims toward truth. You know, we want to we be able to not just know the truth, but to become some type of, 
develop skills that will allow us to pursue the truth successfully. But to walk in the truth and to walk in love are very similar. Yes. Right. You're not walking in love. I mean, I mean, we're talking about transcendentals here, and so when you reach the transcendental point, it is the good and the true uh, are the same thing. And the good and the true together, and one burst uh, of insight will be known as beauty. But these are all transcendental, uh, transcendental goods that we pursue. So, you know, the good in terms of action is, uh, we pursue the good in terms of action by uh, ethics, uh, politics, and economics, you know, practical reason. In terms of truth, we pursue it other ways. But, I mean, the goal is the same. So why should we uh, succumb to fear and constantly prohibit, or either fear or hatred, let's say Phobos, because that covers all of our bases here. Why should we succumb to Phobos and then short-circuit this this project, which is the project of civilized uh, culture. Why should we do this? Well, we do this because, first of all, the people who are perpetrating it are consumed with fear and hatred. And then there are the people who should be defending Logos who are cowards. And you put those two things together and you have a period of inexorable cultural decline. And I think that's what we're all experiencing. We've been experiencing this for a long time. Well, Where the people who should be defending the good and the true are too cowardly. And this emboldens the people whose main uh, focus in life is fear and hatred. Fear and hatred. One of the things that I wrote about recently was the uh, uh, an 18-year-old high school student in uh, California was given a present by her grandfather. The girl is Jewish, and the grandfather gave her a free trip to an IPAC conference. <laughs> this reminds me of the jokes about... Now, tell them what IPAC is. The uh, American-Israeli Political Action Committee. Second largest lobby group in the country next to... Yeah, and probably the most effective, makes uh, much more effective than the NRA, in, certainly in terms of foreign policy. Anyway... Uh, the free weekend at the IPAC conference uh, reminds me of the stories about Philadelphia. You know, the, fir the contest, the first prize was a week in Philadelphia. The second prize was two weeks in Philadelphia. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and the, the, okay, the punishment so the, was the three weeks. <laughs> the, prize, the prize is a weekend at the IPAC conference. Okay, so the girl goes there, obviously full of think thinking this is going to be a good thing, and she's appalled. This is an article that was written up in the uh, Calif newspaper in California. She's appalled at what she sees. And what does she see? Constant fear-mongering. This is all you see. Now, this, these, this, is, this is sort of the, the, the psychological dynamics of Jewish organizations like IPAC. In other words, they capitalize on the fear. Constantly, they have. She said they have pictures, for example, big screens all over the place, big TV screens, and the one screen first it's flashing a picture of Hitler, and then the next second it's flashing a picture of uh, Ahmadinejad from Iran. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hitler, he's the he's the Hitler of the week, and then the the banners will say the time is now. Well, this is fear. This is what you're trying, you're trying to promote fear among this group of people, and you're trying to promote fear because you know this is a way of controlling people. Well, how about where the Christians, with, uh, they believe Christ is going to come back any year, you know, like they've been saying for, well, since Azusa Street, since 1906. They tend to be very much into the Israeli camp. Isn't, aren't there two, those fears, don't fears tend to gravitate to each other? You would know better than I the fears of the uh, evangelical crowd. I tend to see this as a, a uh, uh, what should I say, another type of manipulation. One of the chapters in Murray Friedman's book is about uh, Ralph Reed. Now, Murray, yeah, the Christian now, Coalition. Now, this, uh, Murray Friedman wrote the book, I mentioned already, the, the Neoconservative Revolution. He's a, uh, worked for the AJC an apologist for the Jewish cause, Jewish organizations. Uh, now, I, I met Pat, uh, I'm sorry, I met uh, Ralph Reed in the early 90s uh, when I was going down to Virginia Beach to Pat Robertson's organization. Why did you go down there? Oh, I was going to collaborate with them on some project or other. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, and Ralph Reed, 
was the well, president of at that Mayor time, Robertson's uh, Christian well, Coalition. Well, at that time, uh, Ralph Reed was president of the Christian Coalition. And uh, at that time, I thought that, uh, well, he's working for Pat Robertson. I mean, obviously, I knew that there were slightly different organizational structures and so on and so forth. But there was clearly a link between Christian Coalition and Pat Robertson. Oh, Pat Robertson won the creative Christian right. Coalition. Right. Okay. So, and this was the head of it. Well, you read Murray Friedman's book, you get a completely different idea here, because it turns out that Ralph Reed was the protege of Jack Abramoff. Now, Jack Abramoff, in case you forgot, is in prison now. <laughs> and he went to jail uh, for influence peddling and, and uh, bribery, I believe, uh, in trying to influence members of Congress. Well, he, Ralph Reed was working with uh, Jack Abramoff. So Abramoff was basically a lobbyist yeah, that went too far. Yeah, I mean, basically got into all sorts of, you know, paying off for, <laughs> paying off things, giving money for, that he shouldn't have given money for, stuff like that. Now, uh, that was a revelation to me. And I think it explains suddenly why, uh, for example, uh, why Pat Buchanan's campaign went down the drain in 1996. Because he didn't back his Because I or was, what? well, I mean, obviously, Pat Buchanan was, he was the Ahmadinejad job of his day. <laughs> if the, I, I, I don't know, but I imagine at the IPAC convention in 1992, they would have Hitler and then Pat Buchanan pictures alternating instead of Ahmadinejad. job. But uh, certainly he was not uh, uh, liked by the Amen Corner, as he called it, Israel's Amen Corner over here. But uh, I, I was there. Uh, working with these people, and uh, that was the end of uh, Pat Buchanan's presidential bid. Because he would not go along with the pro-Israel. No, he was against them. And uh, he, this was in uh, 1996. It was the South Carolina primary. Ralph Reed threw the Christian coalition behind Bob Dole, and that was 33 the end. degree Mason. And that was <laughs> and that was the end of Pat Buchanan's campaign. So now suddenly, well, wait a minute. Well, if he were working for Pat Robertson, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. But now if he's working for Jack Abramoff and all that, well, now it does make sense. It's, but Pat Robertson is very pro-Israel. Right. Uh, right. Radically so. Right. And, but well, all I'm saying is that you, it, it's, the evangelicals are befuddled because they're constantly being subjected to, this, to uh, leadership that is really not representing them. That's what I'm saying. If the Christian coalition is called the Christian coalition, but it's really not representing the interest of those of those people. No, because the people that get in leadership somehow get there by not by the representative method or something. Well, they represent the people who have the money to fund their organization. And so you find that money corrupts all of these operations because you work for the person who gives you the money, not the person that gives you the votes. This is the way the political process works in this country. And the Jews and money, I mean, that's historically, that's the stereotype. Jews well, this money, is, right? now, then, now we got into uh, this uh, General Clark. Wesley Clark just got in trouble. This, again? Uh, again. Th this is now, once again, we are dealing with this touchy subject. And General Wesley Clark recently said that uh, there's going to be an Iran because the New York money people want war with Iran. Now, as soon as he said this, uh, Abe Foxman of the ADL uh, said that there was this was a code word for Jew. He was defaming the anti-defamation league. Well, so. and I think now let me get this straight. Now, someone accused him of using this as a code word for Jew. I think Abe Foxman stepped in and said, uh, "No, he's not an anti-Semite, but he shouldn't use terms like this. His father's Jewish." Wesley Clark's. Yeah, that's what he said. That's Dad what is Jewish. Out. Yeah. But uh, he shouldn't be using terms like this. Well, if you're a candidate uh, for the presidency, it's your job to go to the money people uh, and get the money. So he should know who these, you know, what they're talking about. But I mean, this is this is part of the 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 death of discourse, the slow death of discourse that we've been witnessing for quite some time now. So they'll give the appearance that they're having a good discourse, but. Well, I think Martin Luther said it. You're not a Martin Luther fan. But he did say the whole key of the Christian life, if you're on the front lines, is speaking out on those issues where it's crucial. And, and you can speak out on all kinds of issues, 
But if it's not the crucial issue, you haven't really said anything. Right. Right. And so on the crucial, and, and, and this is the crucial issue of our day, and you're not allowed to talk about it. Well, this is where the attack is. I mean, this is where everything is going to fall apart if we don't fix uh, the dam at this point. Yeah. So I'm not, I, don't, I don't know whether we have much um, control over the course of human events throughout the world. We're, we're small and insignificant people. But it, would be it will be interesting to see if there is some type of movement on this front in South Bend, Indiana, because that's all we're talking about here. Why was this discourse prohibited in South Bend, Indiana? And are we going to allow this continuing prohibition of discourse by a very small group of people? Now, ultimately, you're saying the reason is they got fearful. Okay, now you could say, well... well I'm sorry, I, as far as I understand that the board was intimidated because uh, Joan told me that they were going to stand by me. And and they I, believed I, in the I, truth of your position. They, they, and all they, of a sudden, I gave, her, I gave her the course description. She read it. She approved it. She sent me the letter saying everything was fine. And then it got vetoed. So we're talking about the board of directors and not the executive director. But, but, but somebody retreated. In other words, they, they, well, the board they got scared, retreated. threw yeah, down their weapons, and ran. Head. Right. The board did. But if, but if you're a Christian, we stand on the gospel that death has been destroyed. If you read Tertullian, Tertullian said, you know, the healthy Christian, basically martyrdom is kind of like something he looks forward to because he's out of here. Get, let's get out of here. And well, no, I'm not looking forward to martyrdom, but I don't have... I mean, martyr means witness. So if you're going to be a witness, you're going to have to suffer for your witness. And I don't think anything has changed. Nothing has changed. We are back with the, the whole story of this is the interesting thing about uh, these, these, the, how these paradigms perdure over history. It seems that nothing has changed. We're still back in the same situation. But, but you were, in other words, the apostles got killed for just simply bearing witness to Christ's death and resurrection. And they, they preached the gospel and then... 11 of the 12 apostles gets, get killed. Yeah. Okay. All, all I'm trying to do is say we are in a mess politically, and I'm saying in order to see our way out of it, we should return to the gospel, to the scriptures, and see what they have to say about this issue. See, the idea is if you just preach the gospel the way they want you to preach it, there'll be no persecution. Okay? But part of the gospel, essentially part of it is, is the Bible says the Jews are the enemies of the gospel. Enemies of mankind. So that, that, has to be, that has to be brought out in your full gospel message. But if you do bring that part out and you shed light on that aspect, that's where you'll get Yeah, I'm not, I'm not expecting the Jews to be happy about that. I mean, if I were a Jew, I'd probably grind my teeth too when I hear that. But we live in a country where we're supposed to have the free exercise of religion. And I consider this, I, if there's, this is religion. This is my religion, what I'm talking about here. I have, this is the prohibition of my ability to practice my religion. Right, right. Did you, I, don't, I don't see it any other way. I mean, I don't know how anyone else perceives it, but that's the way I perceive it. I was, I was contracted to give this series of talks by a group of people who share my religious beliefs, and the rabbis came in and intimidated the people and stopped it. I don't think that's, that's, not, that's not tolerable. That's not American. That's not the American system. No, because your religion with the church fathers, they would all agree, especially Christendom and name them all, that what you're saying is, is a very important part of the whole Christian position, the whole gospel. Wouldn't they say that what you're saying? I don't see, see how you can read the gospel without having to make some type of judgment about the type of things I'm talking about. And I'm saying that if you want to understand a way out of the mess that we're in, the best place to go is back to scriptures. Is that, so, is that so hard to understand, that a Christian would say something like this? I mean, what else am I supposed to say? Go to astrology or crystals or, or uh, race theory or something like that? No, I don't believe in that stuff. But I do believe that the Gospels are relevant. And the, 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 key, the key concept that goes from beginning to end is this idea of revolution, this constant temptation to take up the sword as a way of solving problems that should be not that, that you can't solve that way. Right, and the constant uh, reminder of St. Peter, because he knew this, was to exactly watch out for those kind of teachers 
He says, uh, for there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Then he goes on, he says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they're not afraid to speak evil dignities. He goes on. But he's saying these false teachers, a characteristic is, well, if you despise government, you're a revolutionary. I Isn't think that's a fair statement. I yeah. think that's a fair statement. A despiser of government and a revolutionary. The, the Christians have, were never told to despise government. They were, never, they were told to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. That was Christ's solution to the problem of the Roman Empire. That was not the Jewish solution. The Jewish solution was revolution. And the Jewish solution led to catastrophe for the Jewish people. Right. Twice in this period of time. In 70, when the temple was destroyed, and even worse, in 132, uh, when the Simon Bar Kokhba re rebellion took place. And, and we're getting to the point, even like my cousin out there in Portland, who's he's about 60 now, and uh, he has he had a marriage, you know, you know, but he's single, and he's got these two boys, and he had this girl who's like 16 now, and real pretty, and uh, he's having to deal with, he's raising them by himself, you know, and the girl's there every once in a while, but she, he said, he said, um, he said, her sense of entitlement is truly amazing. In other words, in other words, these kids are like so far off the wall compared to you know the, what we were used to. And he was a he, he was a revolutionary type of guy growing up. But he said, he said, well, either you get over it or you dis you're destroyed by it. That's that's the, they're the two alternatives when it comes to revolution. And it's infecting this country. It says in Isaiah chapter 3, a lot of people use this verse today. Um, Sugenis, I think, uses it. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. Well, this is the revolutionary path. Well, look, I mean, look, just in terms of the current situation, look at the Baker, the Baker Hamilton report no, I'm not on sure. Iraq. Well, I mean, what were they arguing? They were urging negotiation. Well, we have a completely willful administration now that, that is, it seems to me is totally Nietzschean in its orientation toward world politics. In other words, the only way that I think that our president thinks he can fail is if, he, if his will does not, if he gives up, if his will is somehow divided. If he gives up and stops willing it, then that was the only possibility for defeat. Well, this is crazy. I mean, and you've got, you've got people who are former establishment figures like James Baker, who worked for his fa the president's father, right. who was like the last attempt of the WASP, what's left of the WASP ruling class, to bring back rationality and debate into our foreign policy. And they're, they're brushed aside. Baker's an anti-Semite. <laughs> He's an anti-Semite. And they're brushed aside, and what we need is more will and more power. So we got like almost a John Brown situation where you had the Websters, the Calhouns, and the Clays up till 1850, and they were holding the thing together. And um, but when they died, it was just insanity after that. I mean, nothing was holding the thing together. And you have this civil war. Yeah. I mean, if once they once the the men that can actually bring sanity to the table, even though it may not even be the right policies exactly. Well, this is my hope. This is my hope, that, sa that sanity will prevail, that logos will prevail, that reasonable discussion will prevail now that we have exposed the machinations of the rabbis. The rabbis thrive when they can work behind the scenes and engage in intimidation and character assassination, and I don't think that's the way to proceed, and I'm hoping that it will not be, they will not have the final word here in South Bend either. Well, it's, it's kind of like, you know... I if we're going to end up with a scripture in Matthew, uh, the last chapter, it says, um, and, um, <clears throat> and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. Secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. They were working behind the scenes. Right, to, to suborn people and get them into lying and denying the truth. And that's not the way to proceed. And that will only lead to something bad. 
that type of stuff only leads to something bad over the long run. And over the long run, I think that these people made a mistake because I think over the long run, the truth is going to prevail because it prevails in the long run. Well, Jesus said that which is done in secret or behind the you know, will be shouted from the house top. So once well, that's what, sort of what we're doing right here today. Because it was done in secret, and now we're proclaiming it from the housetops, and we're saying this is not the way to run uh, discourse. This is not uh, this is not a viable option for public discourse. Right. And so, for all of us to walk in the light, all of us are tempted to take the revolutionary route and do things not in the light. And <clears throat> the encouragement is: we need to come to Jesus by the grace of God and confess our sins and own up to who we are and, and let the light of his countenance, the blood of, that he shed on the cross, wash away our sins and let the words of Christ cleanse us and wash us and we can walk in truth and walk in love. And uh, that's the only way to live. And hopefully uh, this issue that Mike has can be brought to the light even more and we will hope to continue to and to do that on this show. Amen.
are under my power. Look into the hypnotic eye. Time now to enter Mr. Lobo's domain. Look out! Open your mind to the possibility that they're not bad movies, just misunderstood. You're not dreaming. You're watching cinema insomnia. Tonight's feature is brought to you in puppet rific Super Marionation. The management is not responsible for injuries caused by thrown voices, uh, and there may be other strings attached as well. I'm Mr. Lobo. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Willie Tyler and Lester. Waylon Flowers and Madam. Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. Nothing reflects our own inner torment and uh, psychological damage more than the blank, dead eyes of puppets and their puppeteers. And tonight we have a really creepy one. Anthony Hopkins, best known for his role as Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter, stars as a ventriloquist who gets caught up in a surreal muppetatoire with Anne Margaret and a uh, dummy that looks disturbingly like Clark Gable, uh, possibly his last role. Um, Cinema Insomnia is proud to present the 1978 chiller, in color no less, entitled Magic. Excuse me. Uh, although um, Cinema Insomnia is um, proud to present to you uh, the 1978 Chiller Magic. It is unfortunately uh, not the film we bring you tonight. Um, instead, um, Child's Play? No. Uh, Puppet Master? No. Nope. Baby Geniuses? No. Uh, Devil Doll? Really? Really? The good one or the remake? Uh, the remake. Of course. And now, without any further ado, the uh, 1964 black and white classic about a possessed ventriloquist dummy, Devil Doll.
never win. You always lose. And you sympathize. 